Welcome back. The third and last session of this conference. The theme for the third session is optimizing skills and networking locally and further afield. In addition to applying for work, how can the newly trained conservator become better involved within the Nordic conservation field in order, in order to strengthen his or her qualifications and experience and build a professional network? How does one become engaged in the field of conservation? What are the advantages of this sort of involvement? How does this differ from the situation elsewhere? And how does a newly trained conservator become engaged with issues? The panel speakers are Britt Christmas Müller, Michael Højlund Rasmussen, Karen Borgersen and Cornelia Weyer. And there will, as before, be time for questions and debate afterwards. The first speaker is Britt Christmas Müller. Britt is a paintings conservator with a master from the School of Conservation in Denmark. Britt has been working as a private conservator <coughs> since 1998. The conservation workshop is associated with Brun Rasmussen Auctioneers of Fine Arts in Copenhagen and restores paintings before and after auctions, as well as providing consultation to their clients in connection with condition reports. I see you. Yeah, thank you. And uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me for this conference. It's very exciting also as a small private conservator to be in this big forum. <laughs> Um, my presentation today takes its starting point um, in my own history of becoming a private conservator. Uh, and to say a little bit about my background, I, um, I grew up sur surrounded by uh, antiquities. My uh, parents, they are, still are, uh, antique dealers. Um, and I actually thought that I would go the history art, going to study history art at the, the university. Uh, but then I had the opportunity, through my parents' networking, to uh, go to Brun Rasmussen Auction House at that time in Vejle, in Jutland, uh, and be there as an assistant for uh, half a year. And while I was there, I found out that this was rather interesting to, uh, to value the, the art, uh, a lot of different kind of art. And uh, after that, I, uh, yeah, I got more and more in involved in these kind of things myself. Uh, so I went to Paris and was a stagiaire in, a, in a, an auction house in Paris, Etude Tachon, for another half a year. Um, and when I came back to Copenhagen, I got an apprenticeship for two and a half years at the Brun Rasmussen Auction House in Copenhagen. So at that time, my, my first... Uh, um, kind of st uh, studying began um, and at that time when you are there for two and a half year you are you are around in all kind of themes you have uh, yeah, the, the different departments you work with the furniture, bronzes, uh, paper, silver, oriental carpets, uh, prints um, and of course paintings and uh, paintings was what I felt most interesting uh, that was what became more and more interesting for me uh, old paintings as well as modern paintings and by time I got the, the opportunity and the responsibility to contact conservators if that was needed um, in a, yeah, when they had auctions um, so when I uh, when I had this experience from my apprenticeship at uh, Brun Rasmussen, uh, and uh, I, I found out that it would be rather interesting to combine what I learned from my childhood and from my education at Brun Rasmussen and to use these experiences in the conservation school. So, um, uh, so when I started studying at the School of Conservation, you could say I had a lot of practical knowledge about how to handle art pieces in general. Uh, I was not afraid of touching the objects. <laughs> and my knowledge was not only through visiting museums. Uh, yeah, I already had experience with uh, 
doing uh, condition reports and to look at the back of the painting, looking for marks, exhibition labels, etc. Um, so, so when I when I started, uh, when I thought about how, how how do I want to use my conservation education, uh, it was obvious. Uh, for me to associate with Brun Rasmussen Auction House, if that was a possibility, if they, if they were interested in that. And fortunately, they, they did. <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, in the beginning uh, of my time as a private conservator, my main customers were clients from Brun Rasmussen Auction House. Uh, but of course, as time um, went by, my circle of clients expanded to private collectors, manor house collectors, uh, people who had inherited paintings, wanted to take care of them. Um, and of course, as a private conservator, a lot of the paintings you get once in a while is not necessarily very expensive paintings, but it's paintings that has a special, special relationship to, um, to the to the clients, they have some kind of affecting value for them. Uh, and also another thing that, as time goes by, the a lot of the clients you get when you are a private conservator, at least in this country, is a lot of by hearsay. Um, you get a you get a client, a client go back, tell their family, friends, relationships about what they have been. Uh, experienced uh, and uh, yeah let me just uh, before I have some I have some topics that we maybe could take for discussions later on but let me just go back to the time when I was actually studying at the School of Conservation because one of the um, one of the most important experiences I had at that time uh, was the internship I had uh, for my for my for myself? It was in Fils Conserving on uh, Kronborg, and uh, at that time it gave me a very good uh, uh, it gave me a, a very good impression of how how is it to to work in the real life <laughs> uh, after school? How how is it out there? Um, and that's a topic I think is very in interesting, and maybe we can go back when we have the discussions afterwards that. I think internship is a, is a very important thing for all of us. <laughs> um, so I have some topics uh, that we can discuss, discuss uh, and one of them is the academic, the academic uh, values versus the practical experience. Um, I am very proud of my candidate title. <laughs> I was in the f first group of, uh, of people from uh, the Danish School of Conservation who got this candidate title. Uh, so let there be no doubt about that. Um, but, uh, yeah, but I think it's very important that we, that we keep on to, to, to the education that we don't get it too academic. We have to focus on all these practical experience that the, that the students, they, they have to get a lot of practical experience uh, while they're at school. Um, relevant practical students. Uh, I've heard, I've never heard any student said that they had too much practical ex <laughs> experience. I've heard, uh, and I ha had the same experience myself, that I maybe had some uh, some courses where we students we thought afterwards when are we going to use this or could maybe we could have had some more practical uh, experience instead of this um, so that's that's a very uh, important thing i think uh, that you keep on to this practical experience uh, and about that also the internships um, and I don't know if we have a little problem here in the Nordic countries uh, about internships, um, because what I what I hear, or what I understand, and you must correct me if if I'm wrong, that uh, a lot of students from, for instance, England or the Netherlands, they come to Denmark with internships. 
We don't have that tradition here in Denmark. Uh, uh, and so, so there is a little problem here because it's important for, for, for the Danish students as well that they have these internships. But I can understand if, if, if the public uh, institutions and us private, it's easier to come to take in an uh, internship from a foreign country that has her, his own money with. In, instead of, as me, as a private conservator, I have to maybe pay this student to be in my studio to work. Um, uh, and, 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 and that is one of the things I, I maybe Karen wants to talk a little bit about also, is uh, how uh, the school um, do the intro... <laughs> sorry, sorry, <Okay>. no. Uh, <laughs> did I say anything wrong? No, no. Um, yeah, how, how the school today, because I don't remember that we had that much introduction at my time, it's many years ago. Uh, how the school make an introduction to uh, how is it to work in a, in a, in a national um, uh, museum uh, and how is it in a, in a private studio. Uh, so you have the private studios contra the <coughs> national uh, institutions. Um, and yeah, I think it's important that the, that, the, that the students in school, that they are taught a little about, have some history about it. Um, how, how, the, how the difference is, because there is a, a big difference. Um, uh, and uh, we probably all have some prejudice each way about how is it to be a private conservator and how is it to be working in a museum. Um, and because uh, as a private conservator you have to be uh, now oh, it's a little roughly said here, but you have to be very direct when you have a customer. You can't uh, you you can't use a a week to investigate to look at this painting. Nobody pays you to use a week to to find out what to do about this, this painting. You have to go more straight ahead. And I know it's a little <laughs> you, you you have to talk take care when you talk about these things, but but the. Uh, yeah, it's a matter of money, of course, and nobody pays you to, doesn't do anything on these paintings. You have to be more, you have to make a, have an idea and then work forward on that. Um, yeah, and, and that, that's, I think it's, again, versus the school, you have an introduction to, to these kind of things, well, the difference, but also an understanding each other, the national, um, um, studios and the, the private conservators. Uh, and one more topic that uh, maybe if someone wants to follow up on, on that for the, the afterwards discussion is uh, uh, the, the thing about collaboration. Uh, I've been told and heard about that, uh, in, for instance, in England, there is a lot of collaborations between private conservators and uh, and the national institutions. Uh, and I, I don't see that often here in Denmark. Of course, we are not a small country. We, are, we don't have that many private conservators, but, um, but it could be maybe something that also, again, the school could talk about, the, the new students, the new um, stu students getting ready for, for work could have in mind that this could be, this, this could, could focus on that field. Uh, I've had some um, collaboration with the, the Danish National Gallery in connection with paintings that should go on auction. Uh, and it's, it's always nice to have these uh, collaborations because you, it's not only just what you have in, what you, this topic you have up now, but it's, you have a, a, a good networking when you do these kind of things and it, it's a good way to to de develop and use experiences. You could easily imagine that you have a private conservator have been going down in a special uh, 
um, a special artist and has a lot of knowledge about this artist that maybe the in, uh, institution doesn't have a specific uh, idea about this artist uh, and the other way around. So collaboration, I think, could be a very interesting thing to, to develop by time. Uh, yeah, all in all that, that, that when we talk about uh, conservation and uh, um, restoration and between we have uh, private conservators and, uh, and public conser conservation studios that you have a, an open and honest uh, discussion about it that we don't have too many secrets between <laughs> e each other. Um, that's what I think is, is, is very important. In this, when I first the first conser conservator I met, when I knew that I was, I would really much uh, like to study to painting conservator. Um, they, I say they, uh, um, they took off, they took their white dress on, but I could, didn't see any paintings, and I didn't see what everything was a secret, and I was just when are they working because I didn't see all these things they did of. I don't think we are there today. It's more public. Uh, we can see a lot of on the internet. Uh, it's, 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 so it's, I think it's definitely getting the, the right way. Uh, we don't have to have our, our recipes don't have to be secret anymore. Yeah. Thank you, Fritz. The next speaker is Michael Højlund Rasmussen. Michael is a paper conservator with a master from the School of Conservation in Denmark. Michael has worked as a paper conservator in the Conservation Center in Weile, and since 2009, he has been head of conservation in the Regional Conservation Center, Conservation Center West in Western Jutland. Yes, thank you very much for being invited to this conference, and uh, thank you for taking the initiative initiative in the first place to discuss all these uh, very important issues. As, uh, as you said, I'm uh, head of a conservation center in the western outskirts of Denmark. And uh, at Conservation Center West, we are working for 15 museums along the west coast and the midst of Jutland. Um, they are both historic museums and archaeological and art museums, so we must have a broad range of professional competences at our disposal. We are only six conservators on a permanent basis and um, ad administrative staff and one to two extra projects-based staff every year compared to an institution like the Conservation Department at the National Museum, for instance, we are a very little center, but compared to the other centers and conservation departments countrywide, I think we're doing well and could be compared. I have chosen to give you a very personal account, a bit like Brit, uh, in order of my experience with the relation to uh, the subject of the conference, obstacles or opportunities because during my career, I have often thought about the choices that I made and the opportunities that I sought and uh, didn't seek. More than once, the question has come up whether I did the right thing or if I should have done something else. Did I make the right choices when pursuing a career as a conservator at all? Or did I just meet the kind of obstacles that could uh, be expected anywhere? To a certain extent, the theme of this session, optimizing skills and networking, gives the answer. Only, how are you expected to do this? What can you do by, to optimize your skills? What can you say your, uh, or could you, or you could say your opportunities? And uh, how do you network? I mean, we got lots of those answers uh, as far as I could hear from the previous session, but I will, um, I will not perhaps give you any uh, specific answers to that, but I, at least I can tell you what I did myself. As stated earlier, I received my Bachelor in Paper Conservation from the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts School of Conservation here in 1986, and later on my Master in 2001 
And later on again, I have added a diploma in leisure management to comply with my present uh, uh, challenges. Back in the 80s, the job opportunities in Denmark were not promising. And since most of the jobs in this country are in the public sector, I knew that I would not, it would not find it easy to breaking through. And as Britt also mentioned, the private labor market in, for conservation in Denmark is quite limited actually. So it, uh, I had to come up with something. In many respects, the conditions for creating conservation jobs has not changed much since then, I think. So I guess my own experience is still valid to a certain extent. But what did I do at the time? How did I manage to create a platform for my later career? And first of all, many of us at that time did not think in terms of a career, not here at least. It was far too ambitious or out of reach. I just wanted the opportunity to prove that I was worth something in terms of conservation. Most conservators try to get small jobs or project-based jobs in order to pursue this ambition. And I did too, but I was a bit restless perhaps and very hungry. So I wanted to work on a daily basis and not just every now and then. So sometime after our graduation, a friend of mine and I set up a paper conservation workshop located in an old bookbinder's workshop that we rented at the Museum of Applied Art in Copenhagen, quite right next to the School of Conservation, by the way. My friend and I ran it, well, my friend Henriette, she ran it for, for several years thereafter, but I only was part of it the first year. It happened so that most of the regular jobs that came up, that some jobs did came up, <laughs> but they came up in Jutland, in the western part of Denmark, and my wife, who happened to be a conservator too, I mean, that's what happens in <laughs> this business, <laughs> got a position at one of those, the museums over there. So I followed her, knowing that paper conservators were actually scarce in that part of the country. So perhaps I had a chance. After a few years, I set up my own workshop, providing paper conservation to museums, archives, and privates. So I have tried it yeah. too. <laughs> Um, I ran that workshop for six years, working full-time, but unfortunately earning half of my efforts. Gradually, it became my primary business goal to get a full-time employment. So you may ask, why the heck did I continue for six years? I mean, it doesn't pay off. You should normally stop after two or three years. But because, like many of you, I think, I had already invested a lot of time and efforts in this career, so eventually it had to pay off. That, I think, is a natural driver for many people in our business. You must succeed because you've spent much time and often more than one education already. Well, I was lucky to get a permanent position finally at one of the regional conservation centers where I worked for 13 years before I got my present position. So in a way, my stubbornness or stupid pride, you might say, <laughs> paid off eventually. But did I make the right choices and would I recommend younger colleagues to do the same? Would further education or optimization of my skills have helped me equally? Both yes and no, I think. One thing is what you believe is the right decision under specific circumstances, or that you don't feel that you have other choices at the time. Another thing is how you view these decisions many years after, burdened with age and experience. That is why a certain amount of a career planning is worth a consideration. I think that was one of the main messages from <laughs> the previous session. I don't generally regret my own choices, but there are th certain things I would have done differently today. One of the things I would do differently would be to get out working abroad. Conservation is an international profession. Make the best of it while you can and before you get too established to be able to move around. You learn so much from people in other places or parts of the world, how they live and work and it opens your mind professionally and personally, and it really optimizes both your skills and your opportunities, I think. 
To me as an employer, I find it much more exciting to employ com com services with international experience. Another important issue is how you get started after graduation. I personally regret that I didn't get a mentor or that I didn't or wasn't able to seek a position with older colleagues for a longer period of time. It is so important to have some role models or key persons whom you respect or who have meant something special to you. I've only had a few short project-based jobs of this kind and they serve today, even today, as my professional foundation. Since I started working as a freelancer right after my graduation, I later discovered that I missed this relation to older colleagues, or at least to have had a mentor. I was very proud at the time, took responsibility for my own life and situation. I wanted a job, so I created one. That was really cool, but still. What I did practically at the, in the workshop was to use my network of fellow students, old teachers, colleagues that I knew. If I had a difficult conservation problem where I needed some sparing or coaching, I would typically call these people and ask for their advice. And I was quite ruthless, uh, I recall. To some people I may have been a bit annoying even, but it helped and it worked for me. At least I must have given the impression of being professionally engaged. I also attended, uh, as was stated previously as well, civil meetings and conferences, even though it was expensive, but it was a very good investment. These helpful colleagues that I referred to before, that I used to call on, those people I consider my close network. But even so, it was tough being uh, on your own, working on your own, and often I had to take tough decisions based on my rather limited experience. The lesson taught was that this way of functioning may work for some, but not for others. In my experience, it seems that many younger conservators are more insecure when it comes to decision making than you should expect when you look at their educational skills. Even if you are well educated and still difficult, it is still difficult to establish the right amount of professional self-esteem needed to take good decisions. But to develop this self-esteem, you need to have a chance to meet older and more experienced colleagues and to work with them and learn from them. A master who passes on his or her experience onto the next generation of conservators is like in an ecosystem in a way. One solution to that could be to create networks of mentors at different levels. Personally, I've tried to work as a mentor for a younger colleague uh, when she took over my former position, and uh, it worked really well for both of us, but it really needs to, to get into shape. I think it's a thing we should work on further. I believe even that this could be modified to work also for young, newly educated conservators without any permanent position, it's a matter of convincing the employing institutions or companies that it will pay off both ways. You could say that actually this has been formalized in Denmark lately so that unemployed people can get short-term jobs paid by their unemployment insurance, partly to encourage employers to stimulate growth and partly to encourage the applicants to widen their network and optimize their skills and thereby their job opportunities. But that's a specific political solution to unemployment, in, in a, an unemployment policy that has been carried on this, uh, of this government in this country. But it is a solution. Personally, I have, no, no, a third thing I will mention is the kind of activity that some of you are taking on right now by organizing this conference. Working politically and professionally with our various organizations, nationally or internationally, is a key factor when it comes to expanding your network. Lobbying for preservation of cultural property locally and throughout the world is also an important gateway to influence the creation of jobs and to promote, to promote conservation in general. 
Personally, I have been politically engaged in conservation matters for several years, first as a board member and chair of the Danish Association for Conservatives, the, the NKF, NKF, I think it's called, which Khan has taken over. A short period as a delegate to, the, to ECHO, and later as a board member of the Danish Museums Association. Last thing is really something to go for because there I am actually in the heart of our main employer. So um, it's a good place. Political lobby work is a slightly different approach to gaining influence and insight, but it might help optimize your opportunities one way or the other. But uh, how this is working, however, is a slightly different story which we could return to at a later stage. But to conclude, you could ask why and what did, what did work for me despite my lack of a master or a mentor or an adequate experience in the first place? How, how, how did I manage in the end? And I think it was, it was stated by many of the, the previous uh, panel uh, speakers uh, before. Um, I had a broad approach to networking and tried to offer something to my clients and to colleagues and to professional stakeholders of various kinds. So networking, networking, and networking. <laughs> and uh, I think Reiki stated that being authentic, I think that's an, a very important thing. Uh, be yourself, but be engaged. Stay on, go for it. It's, uh, you have to be stubborn, you have to believe that one day it will pay off eventually. Put up your finger, state your mind, ask silly questions. There are no silly questions. It's exactly. only silly answers. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was uh, Caroline Roberts who's, who's, uh, who, al who also stated this very clearly in her uh, paper, Opportunity Through Engagement. I think that is perhaps the uh, bottom line of it all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Michael. The next speaker is Karen Borgersen. Karen is a paper conservator with a master from the School of Conservation in Denmark. Karen guides students as a student counselor at the school and runs the Secretariat of Encore. Karen is chairman of the board of the Nordic Association of Conservators in Denmark, and as a result of this, is part of the board of the IIC Nordic Group. As chairman, Karen also participates in the biannual ECHO President's Meeting. Well, I'm not anymore a practice, practicing conservator. Um, I have been a bureaucrat for quite some years, but st still I'm in the world of conservatory restorers and I do a lot of networking. I just have to fix my paper as well. As well, through my working life, I've managed to gain a large network within the conservation field. And I would like to present a little of the um, of my experience with this network, and I made PowerPoint mainly to get give you the, the opportunity to get the websites. So it's very it's a very short uh, presentation, but well, I'm a chairman of um, NKFDK. I took over after Michael, and uh, we have been working together for actually for nine or ten years. We've worked very close while well, I was vice chair and Michael was chair. And Michael is a very large, he has very, he's r really a part of my network. <laughs> um, but during arrangements and meetings like the Yeri, like the, uh, the Yeri General Assembly, I have met lots of colleagues. Um, this is a picture from the last General Assembly. We were not very many, but it was very nice to be there. And 
I hope we will be more next year when we will not be in the center of judgment where mainly Copenhagen's people were coming. <laughs> but, well, maybe I can go back. But I will talk about a little about uh, ODM, the Association of Danish Museum. Michael Michael no mentioned them before. Once a year, they organize a meeting for all museum employees in Denmark. Uh, one session dedicated to conservatory restorers. This is a place for all to present subjects to colleagues from the newly examined bachelor presenting her projects to the trained conservator presenting stories and questions from the real life. During these meetings, I've got to know lots and lots of colleagues, from mainly from Denmark, covering all sorts of objects. This helps me helping colleagues, students, teachers, etc. to find each other when someone needs someone to help with, well, glass or metal or... It's easier for me to look down and see who do I know and what are their experience because I know from the Fulso meetings, as they're still called, that um, I can find colleagues there. The School of Conservation, well, that's where I work. And the students from the School of Conservation, the new one, the, the, the present and the earlier, they're all a part of my network. And we have, a, a s well, the master students, they, col they, uh, they get to know each other from several years, but we take in students every third year, and it's hard to get to know the previous students if they leave the school. But luckily, a lot continues with the master and get to know students from other years. Sorry. In the Nordic countries, well, the subject of the <coughs> session was Nordic Network. Actually, the NKF is the Nordic Association of Conservators, or the IRC Nordic Group. And we publish a, a publication called Meddeles on Conservation. No, Meddeles on Conservation, it is mainly in the Scandinavian languages, but with abstracts in English and Finnish. Um, this network consists of conservators from Iceland, Finland, Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, and it holds a meeting every year, and it's very nice to get to know colleagues from the other Nordic countries. Earlier, mm, they were mainly all trained in Copenhagen. Luckily enough, there are now schools in the other countries, so we get to know how do they do in the other countries and talk to each other. That's very nice. Every third year there's a conference and the next, the last one was last year in Norway and then every three years we have a course and the next one is in October this year in Gothenburg where we will have the yearly, the meeting of the board of NKF. I have a picture here from the conference we had in Denmark four years ago. Um, we went on a trip, uh, well, that's part of the networking. We went on a trip by bus to Jutland and visited industrial heritage sites and got very close to each other and that's another, yet another part of networking and another way to get enlarging your network. In Europe, I have, well, NKF, DK, the IRC Nordic Group, Danish section, as well as NKF D of Finland and Sweden, Norway, are all part of ECHO, the, the Confederation of European Conservatives Restri uh, Organizations. And I've only attended a few meetings as president, 
Michael has been there several times as president and as eco delegate. But I have, but during my work with Encore, yet another European network, I've got to know lots of the members of the board, of the committee of Echo. And when you know some, when you get to the president's meeting, you get to know some more by mingling during the coffee breaks and lunch breaks. Encore is the network of the educations in Europe. And that's, well, I'm running the secretariat of Encore, so I feel very strongly about this organization. <laughs> um, I'll come back to this. This picture is from the coffee break from the last ECHO President's meeting in April in Lisbon. Very nice. Was lots of people from different countries. So some of them are members of the committee, some are just delegates and presidents from different countries. Well, my recommendations to all of you is attend student meetings like this one and the Encore General Assembly next year, well, n the next one is next year, it's biennial, it will be in Liège, Belgium, and we always have a student session. And it's very nice to, for the students to get engaged and come and meet, meet students from other schools in a context of education where you discuss the subjects of, conserva of um, conservation. Actually, next year, a main topic will be practice. And, um, but you'll get to know much more if about this. When, if you go to the, like the Uncle website, when we announce the General Assembly, haven't done that yet, but it will be next year in Liège. This is a picture from the first time we had students on board on the General Assembly. It was in Turun in Poland in 2003. And actually, one of our students from the School of Conservation, Linda Brown. Other conferences like this, like this, a good idea. It's expensive, but you get, you expand your network and you get information on research and what's going on in the field if you attend conferences and there's two conferences next year and I understand they're within a week or something. It's not that. And the, well, it's the IIC biennial and the ICOM CT triennial in the other end of the world. <laughs> hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. The next and last speaker will be Cornelia Vea. <laughs> Cornelia Vea. Cornelia is a trained paintings conservator and PhD student at Zurich University. Cornelia has lectured on art technology, restoration ethics, and the history of restoration. Cornelia is an ISE council member and the former vice president of VDR the Verband der Restauratoren. Today she is director of the Restaurierungszentrum der Landeshauptstadt Düsseldorf. Thank you. I would like to start with something like a definition. And I ask you to please allow me making use of the wording I have prepared. <laughs> to be involved means to take part, to take part in something that deserves your interest. As a result from your involvement, you expect, not at least, to become visible to others, whom you think to be of some importance for your professional success. Involved people together will form the circle where you, as well as the others, can do what we call networking. Involvement and networking are indeed of great importance in professional life. 
Both are therefore worthwhile some reflection. In the description of this section, the organizers ask how young conservators might get better involved within the Nordic conservation field. Others are, of course, better experts in this context. But I am, in another place, involved in more or less the same field since long too. And I remember well from my biography how it was to get to, to go first steps into the professional world of conservation. I'm happy to share some of my experience of those days with you, and I hope it is of some value despite, despite of our difference in age and location. So how to strengthen skills we all have learned at school and we were trained that when we were studying at universities. In order to widen our knowledge, we therefore read books, articles, the news, and we attend congresses and listen to conferences. As conservators, we also have experience that performing conservation work teaches us a lot, which is an ongoing lifelong process, of course. Learning can be lonesome. You have to adapt, to adopt and digest knowledge on your own. But it can also have a social aspect. That is, when you are engaged with the same matter within a group, reading the same book, sharing bits of knowledge in a discussion, cooperating in performing a conservation task, or as we are doing right now, attend a Congress. Both, I would say, lonesome learning and learning in a team can be full of joy and sometimes, of course, a nuisance instead. Me, as a youngster, was op optimizing my skills within a very long period of learning. I studied art history along with and after my training as a paintings conservator. So, while I was trained as a conservator at the Swiss Institute for Art Research, I went to art history classes at Zurich University in my spare time. And when, after three years, I had finished the basic training in conservation, I used to do some practical work during semester holidays, either in a museum or as a freelance, freelancer's aide to a friend. I remember vividly from that time how exciting it was then to change from one world of experience and expertise, expertise to another, to change between these two worlds, to compare working atmospheres here and there, and ways of approaching and understanding something in art. Comparison is, to my opinion, good for learning. My way of training in two fields, two formation programs, is nothing to copy today. As you all are offered conservation courses that include a certain amount of art history in themselves, and maybe you personally do not need as much of it as I did. But there might be something of interest for you to extract from what I did. I found out that my experiences in one and the other field enriched the work of both groups that I belong to. The art historians in the art history seminars and the conservators in the studio. Thus, an advice concluded from my experience might be, sharing authentic experience is a good starting point. A starting point for getting involved, becoming visible, and in consequence, networking. Communication is important within and outside of our own profession. Daring to communi communicate is a starting point. Where was my personal net that has had evolved this way got strengthened then? There is a simple answer to this question. It was, was strengthened by involvement in the professional body, 
which means I became part of professional organizations and attended their meetings and congresses. Nowadays, you have a rich choice of where possibly to go, whereas in comparison in my first years in the 70s, decision was much easier because there was namely one big conference on conservation items every year in my native country, Germany, and another one in Switzerland, where I lived. Sometimes an art historian's or heritage care meeting would be of further interest, but that was all. So I went there and I met those people again that I had become acquainted um, to while I was trained and later on engaged in various places. As soon as I earned enough money to do so, I also attended ISC and ICOM CC congresses, of course, being a member of ISC since long before that. This sounds a little bit like advertisement, mm -hmm. but I mean it quite seriously. Congresses are great, mm -hmm. as well for knowledge transfer as for networking. Their advantage is they add knowledge to the knowledge you already have. You meet people, which is a pleasure in itself, most of the time, to be completely <laughs> true. <laughs> Furthermore, listening to others' talks, watching their projects, might inflame your interest for one or another problem that you had not been aware of before, or for a problem you were trying to solve but couldn't on your own. Sometimes, confrontation with other people's work also makes you reconsider your own situation, your visions, and possibly help you develop both further on. This can feel like pure inspiration, positive, or it may come up with a slight feeling of frustration. Um, you may just feel inferior to the splendid work you listen to. My experience is that both inspiration and frustration are moving you on in a much better way than unpuzzled self-assuredness. You may say that living far away from each other and far away from places where congresses are given makes things difficult. In brackets, I have a question for you. Is communication over distances part of the Nordic condition of life? Whatever the answer to that is, we all know that nowadays networking also comprises the use of the media. You may use or even create social media, blogs, fora, discussion platforms within the net. Write about the items that bother you, describe good conservation work you have done in an article and have it published there or in a traditional journal, of course. And thereby you will meet others, exchange knowledge, and as well make acquaintances. Modern social media are great helps when you want to accelerate the process of engagement in professional matters. But I would like to stress that it is important not to forget about what I recalled earlier about authenticity as well as in your own experience, as in communication, authenticity is a must, as is the Wilfer. <laughs> so my advice is not to stop traveling, meeting real people at their studio, invite them to your own working place, create circles of people with similar needs. In conclusion, involvement does not only ask for conditions that promote you, but also for a certain personal attitude and behavior on your own behalf. Openness, engagement, activity. So I finish with an invitation. Come and visit me and my team at Düsseldorf Conservation Center. <laughs>
And as before, please raise your hand and we'll bring you the microphone and please stand up and say your name and where you're from before asking the question. Participants watching the session over the web are also welcome to ask questions or comment via the web stream or Twitter. And remind the participants using Twitter to post questions by using the hashtag, which can be viewed on the IIC Facebook page. Any questions? Is there something the speakers would like to elaborate on? Well, I'll just let everyone know that when I was a first year graduate student, I went to go visit Cornelia in her lab. <laughs> I spent my summer in France and ended up going through Germany and I asked each of the labs in all the major cities if I could come by and visit and she very graciously accepted myself and my colleague from our visit around and it was wonderful. So do take her up on that invitation. <laughs> Yeah, I'm Julia, I'm from Munich, and yes, I wanted to ask because there is also a bit of a frustrating, uh, how do you say, notion to networking, because uh, we talked about it earlier with some other students at lunch, that sometimes you feel that the conservation world is so small that people actually hire only people they already know, so that sometimes also, you, yeah, I, I know that from my own experience as well that there is a vacancy, but then somebody gets a call and says, please send in your application and we're going to take you. So actually all the other applications are somehow in vain. So I wanted to ask if that is just an impression of, or if that is the truth or <laughs> what do you think about it? Yeah, well, I, uh, I thought, yeah. I actually did prepare another paper uh, <laughs> addressing that issue because, um, but uh, I chose to give my personal account anyway, but uh, because it was more or less a presentation of my workshop and my center. And uh, we do have from time to time, uh, we are not that well known, but we do have a lot of applicants uh, that are just applying for jobs. And we have, a we have had especially previously a lot of interns as well. And we would very much like to continue with that. But uh, what we do many times is that some of those jobs that we have, do, you know, the short-term jobs, are being uh, allocated to those who have presented themselves. And I think Jan uh, came, came uh, on to it as well, that, that people must come to us and then we will, we will choose. Uh, but sometimes, of course, we have uh, um, job uh, job announcements, uh, but in many cases uh, they are so short term that we will take what we have in the archive, <laughs> so to speak, uh, and that is why it is very important for you uh, to uh, to hook up with us. And I will also give you an invitation to Conserving Center West. And I do it in, in the spirit that we are actually, believe it or not, a very international team there. Uh, I have two Germans on a permanent employment and a Bulgarian painting conserva conservator. <laughs> and many of the people that we have, have had as interns are coming from abroad. So it is a place that is widely visited from, from, from people from all over the world. Um, and, and I think it, we should continue doing that. We are perhaps not that visible, and we still have to upgrade our website and a lot of other things. But please don't hesitate. It's in that respect uh, very much up to yourself. Well, I would like to add some co uh, a short comment because it's my experience from the students at the School of Conservation when they have been out in internships during the summer holiday, during bachelor study, or for a four month period in the masters, it's much easier to get these short time jobs. For the more permanent solution in Denmark, you have to set to announce them. But the short time jobs, they're often given to those you know, because they've been there on a short period, but in an internship so 
you might be right. <laughs> just wanted to add to this that uh, when we have these vacancies and uh, as our profession is more and more a female process, a profession <laughs> as you can see around here, <laughs> we regularly have pregnancy leaves which also opens up for short term uh, employment. And we are very careful when we have the applications not just to take the ones that we know from previous times. Mm. We try at least to uh, be very precise in defining what is that we want that person to fulfill what are the job requirements so so it's not too much of the same people it's sometimes hard for those out there to understand why was i not chosen this time because i've been applying ever since you had uh, jobs vacancies and i am much more experienced than anybody else but it depends so much on that precise uh, description that you have that uh, that uh, sometimes those with the highest qualifications or longest experience are not necessarily the ones that have the job depends so much on the individual situation, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Uh, we have a question from the web, which is perhaps more relevant for some of the past sessions, but perhaps you could ask, or someone else from the audience. Uh, Megan Kathleen is asking, uh, what, uh, yes, what do, uh, how do employers see the, uh, the uh, web interview? Um, how do they view that? Um, do they think it's a good idea? And what could what can applicants do to make the most of this type of interview? If you have any comments for that, I, c I have a quick answer. Uh, our administration, which is a big hierarchy above conservation, doesn't feel in a position to do that. Mm. I would like to do it because we sometimes have very interesting applications from the states or elsewhere. And uh, it's really difficult to invite somebody and not be sure the person really gets something from it besides a good talk and uh, yeah. <laughs> a guided tour to the studio, but uh, we can't do it. We increasingly use, increasingly use Skype and other forms of communication on the web. For actually, not just for, uh, we use it a great deal for day-to-day -day work because our staff are distributed across England, Wales and Northern Ireland and it saves costs considerably if, if it's possible to um, hold meetings like we're doing here online and we also interview people um, online and actually with Skype um, it it just seems we're so used to using it it seems to work very well so I'm not sure that it's necessary to <laughs> I could tell I could tell an anecdote actually uh, but maybe I won't about being careful about what goes on in the background when you're being <laughs> Details, but I think you can maybe imagine for yourself. So, so there will be a tip about just making sure who in your family uh, comes into the room when you're if you're being interviewed by Skype. Or <laughs> but apart from that, it now feels we're getting so used to that form of communication that I think that it works well for interview. The only thing I would say is it's f when you interview people face to face, it's very nice to make eye contact, and I'm always in a room, if people don't look me in the eye, you know, that, that always feels a bit odd. And of course, what happens when you're on Skype is that you're looking at the screen yeah. and the camera is a bit high. So we now are used to that. So we just allow for people not, not looking us in the eye because that just doesn't happen with Skype. Hello, my name is Jette. I study for my master's at the moment at the School of Conservation and here in Copenhagen. Um, I have a couple of questions on the job situation for us new conservators coming out. Um, now, I think there's a few of us here are coming increasingly surprised since we started the education at how important all this networking is. Um, I know also that I'm not the only one here who has a, a different 
education before we start. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe we're not looking for, I mean, all of us are not looking for a long, exciting career in conservation, but we're simply looking for a job mm -hmm. to get our hands on mm -hmm. and, and something to do. Now, is it really so that we have to join, uh, go to all these conferences and uh, uh, spend so much time with the bureaucracy, as you say, just to get a job? Or is it more because the employers are really mostly looking for um, people who want this career? Um, if that is so, um, um, maybe is the situation so that maybe there is, are too many conservators being educated today compared to maybe 50 years ago because of the acceleration of the academic, uh, you know, there's more and more schools are turning up all over the world and the schools are becoming more and more academic. So maybe there are so many conservators now that it's more difficult to get a job. As our friend uh, Jon Wedham said, that he may get 40 applicants for one job um, I think this could be interesting to hear from you. Well, I don't think um, Rick Bjarnhoff, I've been on the session before, most of you know me. Um, I don't think that the situation within the world of conservation is different from what else professions you are talking about. I think it's a uh, fact that's the way you find a job today whatever you are into plumbing or conservation or an architect or something like that i think it's um it's another way of getting jobs making a profile for yourself make yourself available and i think it's the conditions today so i don't think it has something to do only with conservation I even think we are a little behind compared to many other professions. So um, I think it's an opportunity, not something bad. And I don't think that we only pick people that we know. I often, if I have a project, here and now project, I have difficulties finding people. Mm. Sometimes, one year ago, I took the list of educated conservators at the School of Conservation mm -hmm. and I started to ring all of them for the last 25 years all the way through and I didn't find anybody. So, I mean, sometimes the job situation is good, sometimes it's not, sometimes people are studying and not willing to work and I know they hate me at the School of Conservation because every time yes. they are... <laughs> People are going to exams, they have to postpone it because I have a job for them. And it's not only the one I pick that I know, it's whoever is out there and I need you here and now. So I think I do give a lot of opportunities to a lot of different people. Um, so, but when I do it, it's also because people all the time call me and say, are there anything, I, the ones who are in front of me when I need somebody like that are the first ones I call. And then I call down the list. But it's not because I want them, it's just because something to do, you're under pressure, you need somebody now and stuff like that. So, so it's not something bad. You have to keep up you know, spirits and uh, it's, see it's not as uh, hard things you have to do to, oh now I have to network again. It's, you know, uh, Christ, all these people, I'm tired of always talking with them. Look at it as an opportunity to be together with good friends. A lot of good friends, you know. <laughs> so, um, well, just a small comment. Oh, no, uh, um, just a comment to Ege. No, we don't hate you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I must say, as a student's counsellor, I actually encourage the students to apply for, for leave when they get the possibility to get a job for two, four, five months or three years. Well, you can't have a leave for three years, but... 
take the jobs if you get them offered. <laughs> uh, we have another question from the web, um, which is also directed towards the employers that are here. Uh, it's Felipa Norton from SACI in Florence. And she's asking if we could discuss the weight of a letter of recommendation from an employer's perspective, uh, perhaps how you value it, or yes, if there's anyone who has anything. Well, I have, I have to understand it right. Uh, what what does she expect? Uh, our policy of writing letters of recommendations. Or, yeah. Okay. Um, I've, I've done it a lot, and I think it's, um, I only always tend to be positive. We're dealing with human beings here, so they have to have a, have a chance to move on. And uh, even though things may not always be as you expect them to be, with, uh, people should have chances to, to move on. So I, th I tend to be uh, rather positive, but I also like to be honest about things. So I state what they have been doing and how they have been performing and graduated simply as uh, according to my my impression of those persons. And if they have been outstanding and have specific social skills, I will state that because that's a way to move forward as well. And you know it, it has been recommended to you, be social, and that's only also an answer to you, that uh, that's, that, that's probably mo one of the most important things when you go to conferences. Um, there's also this uh, little detail that you get wiser, you get more knowledgeable about your profession and your subject that you're interested in, but first of all, you get to get together with other people, and just the fact that you know them and get befriended, as Rikki says, is very important for uh, having some someone to refer to when you are applying for a job. So uh, I think these, you know, references, every time you can help people referring to each other, I think you should do so, because it, it helps networking. When you apply for a job, how do you, what value do you put into the recommendations that the, the applier um, gives with the application? Should I? If you have a comment, or I don't want to ask. Yeah, well, I, 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 I certainly put some importance into it, and I try to view behind the words, see what, what's, is there a hidden message here, or, <laughs> or anything, or is, is, are we just stating what this person have been doing? Uh, and and uh, and then of course you could also call the the referee I think it's called yeah uh, to see whether to, for further information perhaps uh, I think we should do that if we feel it's necessary but um, uh, yeah that's why how I view it. Yeah. Um, I would like um, to make a statement about formats. To me personally. I write and I read um, letters of recommendation and certificates and whatever, uh, portfolios, not that often yet, but, um, and many of those papers are very beautiful, sometimes so beautiful I can hardly see the nucleus in it, and I don't like that, <laughs> but that's a personal statement. And um, I wouldn't make such a big thing about the format. The important thing is that you as a professional person and as a human being in an authentic way become visible to me. And so it's not really the question if you go networking in a conference or if you are good friends with those that you studied with, but it's important that you are an open person that tends to learn, to continue learning while you are practicing you shouldn't just stick to what you have already. You should be open. So if you don't like conferences, maybe you read many books. But you shouldn't uh, just think about uh, networking to others is exciting. If you have this opinion, it's, it looks to me like a mask, not a profile. Mm -hmm. If you try to do something that is not your thing. Mm -hmm. So formats are not of that big an importance, uh, importance to me. And I have to choose many people from many kinds of papers. And I see the differences uh, from countries, like letters of recommendation are 
less common in Germany, but if somebody wants to go to Austria, I have to write one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you put a name on from somebody you work with as a referee, please ask that person before you put the <laughs> name on. <laughs> Very good idea. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Snorri, just a, a thing on networking. When you go networking, you're fishing. Um, and there has to be something in the net. So you have to put something in the net. There's no point going f uh, networking if you have nothing to put in the net. Um, empty networking, <laughs> just meeting people saying that you've got to come with something. So you come with your latest paper, you come with your project, something you to contribute, otherwise it's empty. And that is extremely apparent to any employer that there's nothing backing up all those fine words, letters of recommendation, networking, whatever. So you've got, it's got there's, as people say, authentic, it's got to be there in depth. I'm Marta from Norway. Uh, Mikael, you mentioned that you missed having a mentor. But how does one go, go about getting a mentor and like, how does it work? I don't understand. I miss what? Having a mentor. Mentor. Yeah. Mentor. A mentor. Ah, yeah, I missed a mentor. Yeah, that's right. How do I get one, you say? Yeah, like, do you have a form of agreement? Yeah. Does it just happen? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Oh, I, it was. It was merely a suggestion uh, <laughs> to follow up on because I have tried this with uh, with a younger colleague and I found it very uh, rewarding and um, I think it's a very good thing to to establish and I know in other businesses it's standard procedure even if you are uh, moving up uh, in the hierarchy to another position you will also ch shift or change your mentor uh, if if I as I did some years ago, became a, a head of conservation, I would, in that case, have another mentor for, for, to help me. Uh, but the, it has not been established in our profession, I think, uh, into the extent, and I think we should think about doing so, and it could perhaps be a task for you. It was, uh, it was the, uh, the idea mm -hmm. behind my mentioning. Um, I have both been a mentee and been mentoring a lot. Um, I would like to recommend it. It's really worthwhile. But I think it's very important. It has to be, um, has some formal, f you know, um, frames around the, the whole mentorship. When you do it, you have to have you know, some, um, some uh, agreements on how it works for how long and what you want to get out of it and uh, what degree of uh, which areas you want to mentor on. So um, since there's not um, an official mentorship program or something here, you could do something yourself by approaching people and saying, would you be my mentor? Could we do something or something like that? You could reach out yourself and try to establish something um, if you're interested. Uh, it would be very natural. It would be somebody you work together with with more experience or something like that. I don't know. But uh, I think you could do something yourself. And it's, it's really giving for both parts. I've learned so much because when you are a mentor, you have to give something different for each person. And you also have to learn to shut up and let people themselves make decisions, good decisions, but somehow you have to prime and you know give up different choices for them and then they make the decisions themselves. So, so it's worthwhile and you can do, you, I, I don't know how the, the feeling is in the field if people want to say, yes, I want to be a mentor because it takes a lot of time. But um, by networking, the <laughs> bad words, you know, uh, <laughs> you might establish some connections where something, it's not something that you just do the night over, but you can perhaps establish something that would be 
um, worthwhile. Okay. I was going to say, um, with the ECPN group in America, one of the things we talked about was mentoring and the importance of it. And we actually put a call out to the membership and asked the membership in the AIC if there were individuals who would be interested in being mentors. And then we asked, are there people who would be interested in being mentees? And we tried to put them together to create this sort of marriage between the two. And we found that there were a number of private conservators in America who really wanted to mentor someone. Um, that they, because they aren't often exposed to maybe students or interns as often as some, that they found it really rewarding to have that connection. And so they were actually reaching out, willing to, even if it was across the country. They lived in California, but they were maybe mentoring somebody on the East Coast because they were able to talk to them on the phone, talk to them about maybe starting their own practice. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine they're not competing with each other because they're on opposite ends of the country. But because that person was a new graduate from a program, they were learning things from that person as well, because it is that relationship between the two and how important that is. And it, it was formal. We actually have a contract that each party signs up on. And, and so we're, we're giving it a try. It's been going on for about two years. Um, I think that they've mentored together, I'm going to say probably 20 to 30 people. It's not a huge number. You know, people are kind of feeling it out and seeing, well, so how was it, was it like being a mentor or what was it like being a mentee? Is it working out for you? You know, there are success cases. There are those that are not success cases. Personally, my mentors have always come from the programs I've graduated from, the conservators I've worked with, maintaining contact. You know, Kay Roberts spoke about that fact that these people that you mentor with, keeping in contact with your professors, keeping in contact with those professionals you've worked with in the past, and carrying that relationship, constantly saying, so So, how are the kids? I mean, it's like these simple little things, but caring, you know, and being a part of their lives, you know, oh, I saw that paper you wrote for the IIC or whichever one of the you know, organizations here, genuinely caring about your colleagues and being connected with them and your mentors. And then you find out that you end up becoming a mentor. You end up talking to someone behind you. It evolves. Yeah, you move through as you move through your career. And I still have mentors. I hope to always have mentors. And they may not even be people who are senior to me. They just have different skill sets that I'm looking to emulate. So I'll approach them or look at what they do and then try to apply those skills myself. Um, at the School of Architecture, they have established a mentor um, mentorship, uh, and I suppose we could look at the School of Conservation, look into what regulation they have on this mentorship, and um, maybe create a similar at the s in the world of conservation. Well, at first maybe we'll do it in Denmark, but expand it to. Scandinavia, Europe, the world. <laughs> well, um, well, I'm Anyone want to come? Hi, it's Megan Monahan again. Um, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. Uh, coming from Canada, we we had a problem um, about we're a big country with not that many people and, and the conservators are very spread out. So it's almost like you're working with different countries in some senses, like who's in different provinces and how that works. And we had an issue with it being, there's quite a large conservation group functioning in Ottawa, which is the capital of Canada. And we had this issue of it being very Ottawa centric in a lot of the way the Canadian Conservation Association was working. And we've been trying to tackle that. And I wonder if maybe the Scandinavian countries might have some similar problems, and if they're tackling it in a certain way uh, that we might be able to learn from. Um, how are you staying in touch and working in a way that is not centric to one country or one region of those Scandinavian countries? Well, we have tried for years during this Nordic Association of Conservators, and it is not easy because um, 
it tends to evolve around the big cities, as you mentioned. And I know from our Norwegian colleagues that mm -hmm. they have problems collecting people or uh, assembling people uh, when they have their ar arrangement. It's always uh, going to happen in uh, Oslo, for instance. <laughs> and, uh, and it's very uh, uh, expensive to travel uh, around in, in Norway. So yeah, uh, there is this problem and I think it's more or less the same for the Icelandic people and even mm. though, uh, not even though, but and, and uh, because they are also very few. And uh, so we have these conferences every third year and that's the place where we tend to meet up and to join and, and, uh, and be together. But since the world has become increasingly globalized, we have also noticed that it doesn't really matter whether we are forming up this Nordic group or trying to, to stick together as a Nordic group. The identity has become more disintegrated uh, during the, the, the past years. So many people are just referring to other countries. For example, for example the Icelandic people tend to be uh, just as much related to uh, the US and the ca Canada <laughs> as they are to, to the Nordic countries. So the, there are those uh, div, um, things going on uh, right now which may just give another picture of the situation and may also give other solutions to those people. Uh, and it's, 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 it's also the linguistic problem. In the old days, we used to understand each other better than we do today. So our working language has gradually turned into English. Not anymore. Uh, really? No. Uh, well, we turned back to Swedish. Okay. <laughs> That's a great achievement. When I, when I was in that <laughs> working. <laughs> we're turning back to Swedish. Yeah. You know, some of those, those coming from abroad probably don't know, but Scandinavians do actually understand each other, but no one understands Finnish, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> <laughs> and Icelandic is thing very difficult. So, <laughs> so that's why we have turned, uh, turned our minds to Swedish. But uh, I also think it depends on the people, it's personalities that are involved in the work. So I think that's the closest I can come to that. have a little um, comment because uh, Amber just mentioned a, a short a thing in her speech right before uh, you were talking about um, uh, networking with teachers. Uh, I find it quite natural to do so because we have been a very close community here at the School of Conservation in Denmark. So when I was you know, calling people when I, if I had a problem, I would also call my old teachers, no problem, and they would answer my questions and we were discussing things. But I learned recently that when these German colleagues of mine that I <laughs> employed were, uh, they, when they heard that, they, they found it outrageous. It was not a thing you can do in Germany, apparently. Well, that was what it. But you were Swiss, <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Um, that I remembered not clearly, I couldn't quote, I wrote to my literature professor at Zurich University years later mm -hmm. and I got the precise <laughs> <laughs> reference. Great. And uh, But be in between I had written Christmas cards and uh, we had friends in common, etc. So it's, uh, it's, it's how important this hierarchy that exists yeah, exactly. mm -hmm. really is in reality. Yeah. If, you, if you are valued as a younger person, and I felt valued by this professor, then you dare. Mm -hmm. if, if it's looking from below up, you wouldn't write Christmas cards, I think. Or it's just a formality and it's not worth anything. But in short, you could say that dealing with hierarchies is one of the tasks that you have to take on yeah. as well, especially in some cultures. Um, came up with and perhaps ask some of the employers out here. 
about the private sector and the museum sector. How does the um, employers in a museum look at a person, a, a new uh, emerging conservator who's worked in a private practice for a while? How do you look at that and in terms of becoming employed at a museum? Well, I can say that that some of that perspective is going to depend on who's doing the interviewing. I mean, I came from a different career, so as a conservator, I can see the value of having tried many different things that makes a person more evolved and brings them brings this outside experience to the museum for me. And I like the fact that they don't just have this cloistered viewpoint of what museums are, and they've not stepped outside to really know what the challenges are in the field. Um, I find that in a people who come to me with outside experience, even if they've been trained in the field of conservation, but had to take, say, a short period of time where they worked with an art handling firm or something, that that experience is really valuable to me. They bring something else that, that's an added skill set. And we've been talking all along about increasing your skill sets beyond just your, your bench skills. Because if I see someone's graduated from a program, I know that program usually, or, or at least about it. I can find out what those training courses are and know that you're talented, that you can do something. Uh, to what level of excelsion, you know, I can tell from your portfolio or CV, where you've been. But to see how well-rounded an individual is based on outside experience, to me, is very exciting. Because they're going to bring that perspective, that added perspective and knowledge to the position, which is, I think, just going to help them as a professional. Um, so I'm in a museum, but when I look at someone, I actually find great value in the fact that they've been in a private sector because it's very challenging and you have to work on the quick, you have to make quick decisions. Yeah. You learn to hone your skills in a different way than the luxury. And I, I don't have a museum that actually has that luxury. We actually operate our lab very much like a private lab. Yeah. I mean, I worked on over 30 projects last year. That's a lot of projects for a museum. We're a high lending institution. And I need to know that when an intern comes to me, they can handle that kind of pressure. I'm not just going to give them one project to work on for a year. That would be very glorious of me to be able to do that. <laughs> Usually they'll have two to three, and then they'll have a lot of small projects in between. So I, I want to see that they're quick on their feet, that they're willing to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. And you spoke about, I think, it was it Mikhail, you spoke about yeah, the idea of that maybe I see in some younger uh, students that they don't have that confidence. Yeah, mm. yeah that y you've been taught well. You know a lot of things. You know you have a lot of mentors, hopefully, of things. And trust that. Um, one of the things that struggles, you know, as a mentor to people is I try to get them to realize they have got great intuition and they need to, to rely on their education and believe in themselves. And I try to evolve that when they work with me because I see it and I want to see them cultivate that um, because that's really going to help them survive out there, if you will. But I think at the outside is gives a lot of experience to a person, makes them very well rounded. Anyone else has comment on that? No? If there are no more, then I will come down the row. Okay. Um, well I guess we can uh, round this up shortly. Um, I'd like to thank you for coming and speakers, and we have a small present, uh, a token of appreciation for you. Before we end the conference, I would like to uh, give the floor to Sarah Staniforth. Um, he's, she's the president of the ISC Council, and she would like to give some closing remarks. Is that on? Yes, it is. Um, I have been absolutely delighted to be with you today. I wish that I could have been with you during the day yesterday, but I was thrilled to arrive in time for dinner yesterday <laughs> evening, <laughs> which I have to say is probably the best conference dinner that I've ever had. Um, it was really, really wonderful. So congratulations to the organizing committee 
um, certainly for the quality of the dinner last night and <laughs> lunch today, which was very much appreciated. But, but seriously, I mean, you have done an outstanding job to organize this two-day conference. It's fantastic to meet you all, and I'm absolutely certain that over the years, well, I mean, you, you, you've probably got more years, well, you've definitely got more years <laughs> in, the, in the profession than I have left, but in the years that I have left, I shall look forward to hearing about the development of all of your careers, and I hope in a small way that these two days may have given you some tips um, to sort of set you off or to help steer you in, in the right direction. Um, just some, some thanks um, from me on behalf of IIC, and I'm gonna start with, with IIC, um, and to thank um, Graham um, in the IIC office in London, and Joe, um, our Secretary General, and Velson, our Treasurer, um, for, all, for what they've done for the conference, but they assure me they've done nothing. <laughs> um, because they say it's been so perfectly organised by the organising committee here that actually it's felt for them a very, a very sort of seamless and um, low maintenance um, conference. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, I, I thank them on behalf of IIC for what they've done. And Amber and Adam, for, for your sort of contributions in the in the you know, the early stage and particularly for um, helping with the selection of the subject for this conference. Um, and I think it's been a really helpful um, and well-directed um, subject. Um, certainly my, my perception, I mean, I wish, you know, I, I was sort of lucky when I was at the court because I knew I was going in the science direction to the National Gallery. But, but you know, there are, it would have really given me confidence to have had an occasion like this um, at this stage, your stage of, of my career. Um, Mikkel, um, can I thank you um, and the School of Conservation um, for hosting uh, the conference. I have to say, you have really outstanding facilities. And, you know, for those of you who've been to the Courtauld, I bet none of you have been to the Courtauld in its old incarnation um, at Portman Square when we were sort of stuck in the mews. Mikkel will remember it, and you and you probably. Will you remember it? And Joe, I know, has been there. Um, but we were in a tiny mew. A muse is where the horses and the, you know, the... The, the grooms used to be in the big London houses. Um, and we had nothing like these fantastic facilities that you have here in the School of Conservation, these wonderful um, lecture rooms here, um, your fantastic um, canteen, and indeed, the, I'm sorry, I won't go on about food. Um, <laughs> And the, um, the very nice rooms that you have up at the school in, in Esplanaden, um, they were wonderful, wonderful looking rooms. And I know that tomorrow, um, those of us who are on IIC Council will be using those rooms um, some more. And I know that we shall very much um, enjoy being there tomorrow. Um, I very much hope, I'm not going to bang on about other IIC events, other than to say that I hope that some of you um, may be able to make your way to Hong Kong next year for Congress. I think you've seen on the board that the poster um, deadline is now, is that, is that 13th of September date right, Graham? Because that's actually tomorrow. It's today, is it? It's today. Yeah, <laughs> but for the stu sorry, Amber. <laughs> oh no, okay, fine. So the student posters has got there's 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 much more time for that. Fine. Okay, brilliant. So hopefully, um, some of you may feel inspired um, to submit posters um, for Hong Kong. Um, and we will be um, talking to um, organizations, um, courses 
who are interested in organizing the 2015 Student and Emerging, um, Emerging Conservator Conference. So there will definitely be another conference in two years' time. And um, for those of you who are still students and emerging conservators, we shall look forward to seeing you then. Um, some of you may well come back and be on the panels to um, share your experience with, with the next generation. Um, and Graham, I think you've got some IIC membership um, leaflets with you for um, anyone who's not a member of IIC and who's interested in, in joining. Um, so, once again, thank you very much to all the speakers today. Um, to the speakers yesterday in their absence. Um, for the technical support today, because it's no mean feat um, to um, have had all the, you know, the comms with the people. We, I mean, I think there were quite a lot of people online. I couldn't really see the screen, but um, there were certainly people from the other side of the world, from Australia. Um, who who were um, listening online, um, and it's a real you know to make all that work seamlessly is fantastic, and to to be running the um, the video recordings. Um, once again, thank you to the organising committee, and Tina is going to um, name them um, individually. But I'd finally like to thank Tina very much indeed for moderating um, everything today and yesterday as well. And I now, in turn, I'm going to hand over to Tina for her final last words. So thank you all very much indeed. Yes, so we're almost through this conference and it's been a pleasure and I hope you've enjoyed yourself. It's not quite over yet, because in a moment there will be a wine reception in the other room. And for those of you who have signed up for an arrangement tomorrow, the Saturday arrangement, please see uh, Mette and Marie. Marie is sitting up here. Please stand up. And Mette, she's sitting in the, in the back there. So please uh, see to them for information about tomorrow. I will thank all of you for coming. And I would like to thank the institutions, uh, IIC and the school, um, KADK, as well as the organizers from the ICC, Graham Vos, um, and Joe Kirby Atkinson. But here I am just a messenger because uh, I didn't help organize this conference. That is the student organizers of, of the School of Conservation. And I think they should come up here, and that goes for Middefalk Porup, Marie Christiansen, Charlotte Remelius, Leah Jensen, Tor Hederus, Louise Tidemann, and then of course Mikkel Schaaf, who has been <laughs> the mentor of it all. Thanks to all of you, and then a final thanks to Nikolai Junkersen and his technical staff who has made the web stream um, possible and the Skype connection and everything. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now there's a line. <laughs>